Hello and welcome. I'm Nicole Palmer and I'm the new executive director of the Friends of the Kochmar Organ. I am joined today virtually by James Kennerly, the municipal organist of Portland, um, and Bob Russell, officially Robert Russell, who is the conductor and music director of Choral Art. Do I have that right, Bob? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you both so much for being here today. Uh, we're just going to talk about our upcoming concert, Carmina Barana, which is going to take place on October 2nd in Merrill Auditorium at 3.30 p.m. You can get your tickets now at porttix.com. Um, and I would love to hear from both of you uh, why you are excited about this piece. Um, let's start with you, Bob. Carmina is just plain fun. Anytime we program it with choral art, I've probably done it four or five times with choral art, a couple of times at USM, um, at least once with a group of high school students and once with another community group. Um, it's just a joy to sing. The, the melodies are so refreshing. It is very classic in structure. Um, which gives us singable melodies. It gives us a sense of tonality. We know where we are uh, in, in, the, in the musical form and the musical structure of it all. And I think the only real challenge of Carmina is text. There's a lot of words. And for choral singers that are accustomed to doing a lot of choral singing, um, they would have sung the mass. Um, Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, Agnus Dei, those texts are relatively familiar to, um, to amateur singers, but all of the texts of Carmina um, present, I think, the biggest challenge. But, but again, the melodies are so much fun that uh, we, we put in the work. Thank you. And what are, what are the language, or is it one language, or are there multiple languages represented? Latin and German. And because Orff uh, was German, we, we will do a Germanic inflection of the text, which gives the text a little more bite than an Italianate uh, pronunciation. Wonderful, thanks so much, Bob. And James, what are you, why are you excited about this piece? And why do you think Portland audiences should be excited? Well, if you look behind me, there's actually a little, uh, a, a screen grab from one of our Christmas concerts. You can see lots of people on stage. Um, and, and, and one of my most fun things to do with the Koshmar organ is to invite people onto the stage. Of course, the, the centerpiece is that pipe facade that you know, covers up a, a few hundred pipes that covers up a, many thousands of pipes. Um, and as the organist, I get to control all of those and make all of these sounds. But when you look at the organ, it seems very unassuming. It's very polite. It's very elegant. The stage in many ways is empty because we have the console that's the, the, the great big wooden um, sort of box that has the keyboards and the pedal boards and the stops that, that, that the organist plays to make all these sounds. But, but the stage when we have a solo organ concert is actually empty. So one of the, the, the things I really love to do is have lots of people on the stage. In fact, today we'll have a record number of about, about 200 um, for the Carmina concert. And that I think is gonna be the most exciting thing uh, and with that comes the hustle and bustle um, almost fighting for space on the stage and the, the joy of even the singers themselves hearing the Kochmar organ for the first time it comes from behind them and many of them won't be expecting the kinds of sounds that they're going to hear and so I think tying into what Bob said and, and really tying into the idea of what Kamina was which was not really a necessarily a choral piece or an orchestral piece. It was written to be a theater piece. I think that Orff called it this uh, Theatrum Mundi, the, the sort of the theater of the world. And a little bit like the operas of Wagner, he talked about the Gesamt Kunstwerk, the complete artwork. And so what Orff is doing here with the Theatrum Mundum is bringing in the dance, the singing, the solo voices, the choral voices, the various texts from the High German and um, Middle German and Latin and the mix of sacred and profane, more profane in the case of Kaimina Brana, which is why it's such fun. Um, and of course, what we're doing is we don't have an orchestra, uh, so the audience doesn't get to look at the violins and the, 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 the flutes and the French horns, but, but what they do get to see, I think is gonna be more exciting. They're gonna see 
all of these singers, hundreds of singers on the stage. They'll see all of the percussion instruments and they will see how that all interacts with sort of the Kochmar organ watching over gracefully with, uh, as I said, that very um, modest pipe shade that hides behind it all of the sound. So I think this piece is all about theater. It's all about fun. It's all about the the art and act of surprise. And, and I, I think that's what makes me so excited about this project. And I think the thing that uh, neither of us has mentioned so far is th the biggest bang for the Carmen Burana buck is the sonority itself. Orff has composed massive sonorities that just knock you out of your seat, as well as incredibly intimate, lyrical, beautiful, um, sublime, and, and, and very precious uh, melodies, um, all within the space of an hour. Thanks, Bob uh, and James. It's it's so exciting. I'm I'm thrilled for this concert. I can't wait. Um, I'm wondering, Bob, if you can tell us a little bit about the singers who are going to be uh, singing in the chorus as well as the soloists. But the the chorus doesn't isn't just comprised of the incredible choral art. Tell us a little bit about who's going to be up on stage. Um, the core of the chorus is the 80 singers from the Choral Art Masterworks Chorus. Um, Masterworks usually does a, a concert a year with the Portland Symphony and uh, regular patrons will recognize the large chorus that has sung on stage with the symphony, um, Verdi and Mahler and Brahms and, and things of, of that ilk, as, as well as the Carmina. And because we have uh, so much <laughs> stage space and because Coral Art really enjoys um, community interaction, drawing the community in as we have opportunity, this is a prime opportunity. And, and so I extended an invitation to high school singers um, and community singers in the state of Maine. And joining the 80 singers of Choral Art are 100 from uh, the community. So 180 um, voices will be ringing forth from the stage um, in, in addition to the organ and the percussion. Including, as I understand it, a number of high school students from around the state. Yes. Um, the high school students, what's the number of the high school students? 50 or 60, I, I think, of the, um, no, of the 100, it's, it's more like 80. Uh, um, three quarters to 80% of the, the guest singers will be high school students. Wonderful. What an amazing opportunity for all those students to be able to perform in Merrill Auditorium, which for people who may not be in Maine, uh, it, it, that's the, the biggest, grandest and most beautiful um, hall that we have in Maine. It's, it's really a very special place to perform and an, and an awesome opportunity for these young people. Great. Um, uh, James, if you could talk a little bit about the preparation, your personal preparation for this concert, including what it's like to make a transcription uh, from, from the various scores that are available for Carmina. Absolutely. So so when Karloff performed this, I think it was at the Berlin um, Festal Opera or somebody like that, we can do some fact checking later. It was written for a full symphony orchestra. So we have our strings and our flutes and our winds and our brass. Uh, percussion, um, piano, even within that that ensemble. Um, he also made an arrangement for two pianos, so piano duet and percussion, and that those two versions are, are really what I've based my transcription on. And what I'm trying to do is reproduce the the colors, the instrumentation, the sonorities that come from the original orchestral version. So, for example, there's a movement where there are the the, the, the trumpets go da 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 da. So I need to find some way on the organ of making that gnarly, brassy trumpet sound. And luckily we have stops that are expressly designed to reproduce the sound of sort of fanfare trumpets. So that's pretty easy to do. But then there are these sounds with the lush full strings of the orchestra. Maybe you'd have 40 or 50 players in, a, in, a, in an orchestral setting. So I have to find a way of doing that, luckily. The Kochmar organ also boasts one of the great collections of, of organ string sounds. I should be clear, all these sounds on the organ are made by pipes. They're different shapes, they're different lengths, they're different thicknesses, they're made from different types of uh, wood or metal, different alloys of metal. All of that makes the different sound colors, the different tone colors for the pipes. 
but my job really is to match the impression I get from the score with the sounds that the Kochmar organ can reproduce. And always my philosophy is stick close to what the composer thought. So the idea that the, the Orth had in his head the sound of a triangle or the sound of the, the double basses and the cellos, for example, or the French horns. Uh, I really start with that and try and reproduce those sounds. Obviously, I only have two hands and I'm not going to show them because I'm not that flexible. Two feet uh, I'm with that and maybe my head if I push down some some keys <laughs> with my nose. Um, but with that's what I have to use to condense that full orchestral score. So I have to make some decisions. What gets prioritized? What gets removed? What is it just impossible to do? What is my wish list when I get into the hall to actually set this up that I might be able to do because there's some way of 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 working around, you know, only having two hands and two feet. And the organ has a number of tricks on it so I can play different notes with my feet for play a melody with my right foot and it sort of divides the pedal compass in half. And then on the lower part of the pedals, I would play the bass part with my left foot. So there are ways, little tricks that we have on the Kochmar organ to make more sounds possible so to get closer to that orchestral score. And then the other, probably the biggest challenge is the percussiveness because the score is very percussive. Uh, you hear in, in the sounds of the singing and the language, because as Bob said, he's using the, the Germanic Latin or the, the, the Bavarian Latin. So that instead of, cheese we're having cis so there's much more sort of percussive speech and percussive instruments and we see this with Orff there's lots of percussion in the organ literally percussive um, but also the use of his piano that he used in the full score and in the the two piano version and reproducing percussive sounds on the organ that's probably our biggest challenge because the organ does lyrical well it does loud well it does quiet well it does legato very well but Percussive is a real challenge. So one of the things working with Bob in in, in all when we get to our dress, we're making sure that the organ sounds percussive, that it has the energy of 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 attack and, and decay that we would get from the orchestra. So that's the long and the short of of the seemingly impossible challenge of condensing all of those orchestral instruments into just one one pipe organ. Well, I'm sure that you're up to the challenge and more, James. I really can't wait to hear your transcription. Um, and speaking of percussion, Bob, uh, I know that there are going to be four percussionists, or maybe we should say one timpanist and three percussionists. How many total it, percussion instruments will they be playing, those four people? Well, that's a good question. Um, a dozen or so, um, maybe 15. Um, I mean, you, you, you've got everything from the traditional bass drum and cymbal and, and timpani, um, and uh, then there's a triangle here, um, and there's the, the, the occasional yeah of a ratchet uh, happening um, uh, at, on one occasion. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a variety. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think watching, to Bob's point, watching the percussionist dance around is something that, that we hope will be foregrounded in this production. Because in an orchestra, the percussion is normally shoved to the back. Um, and that's really because they play very loud, very big, spacious um, instruments. And we tend to put them at the back of the, the stage. And so as an audience member, you might not have even seen the way that the percussionists work. The, the, when you play the timpani, they change the pitches of the drum by stretching the drum head to make the, the, the sound higher or relaxing it to make it lower. And they do these with pedals and, and almost, you, you wouldn't have even seen it because it's done with such magic and, 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 and subtlety. But we're hoping that you will actually see them move from one thing to the other. They'll be playing the tambourine and they have to go to the sleigh bells, then to the tam-tam and then to the cymbals and the triangle and the, the antique cymbals and, and the xylophone and the gong and glockenspiel. Uh, and so with, we're hoping that that theatre again will will present itself. We don't have the original dance that, that that this was written for, but we do have that sort of dance of the stage musicians and the, especially the percussionists and the conductor. Uh, <laughs> well, in fact, James, the percussionist will be over your right shoulder um, in in the background where the choir right now is standing is where the percussionists will be. So they will be in full view of the audience. Mm -hmm. Precisely. <laughs> And very uh, loud. As the conductor, Bob, are there any particular things that you want to draw people's attention to? When I say things, I mean movements. What 
what are you excited to share with them? What particular um, uh, movements or even uh, phrases, um, sounds, do you want people to li listen out for especially? Well, I, I think the challenge um, that I have um, on stage is to, is to be a, a very compassionate and a very capable uh, traffic officer and to, to, keep the, to, to keep the traffic flowing and to do my best to give enough information to the singers, to the instruments, to do their job, and then to get out of the way and to let the singers sing um, with their full expressive voice, with, their, with, with the, the greatest shout that they can make or the most lyrical whisper that they can make. Um, and that's, that's what we're aiming. So sometimes my gestures are grand and sometimes my gestures are intimate, trying to reflect and, and guiding the singers the percussion, the organ, to to making the kind of sound that Orff really wanted to hear at any particular moment. Mm -hmm. And how about you, James? Are there any particular um, uh, movements that you are excited to share more than others? I mean, I'm I'm sure they'll all be stunning. But what what do you hope that people will be listening for or hearing on October second? I, I, I hate to spoil it for everybody, but I'm going to, for all the people watching this video, uh, the beginning and the ending of this piece starts, uh, they, they, they use the same music. And if you have ever heard this piece, you will know from the very first note, um, which is the full orchestra and the, the percussion that whack um, this very first note of the very first piece, um, O Fortuna, when we're singing about the spinning wheel of fortune um, and how fickle everything appears to be. Uh, at the beginning of that, you will have heard in movies, you will have heard it in sort of comedy spoofs, you will have heard it in um, advertisements. It is kind of everywhere. And I think it's one of the most iconic, if not perhaps the, like the top two most iconic pieces or extracts of, of classical music ever. Um, and, and so I think the idea of playing that, because I get to play on beat one and the choir sings on beat two, uh, that's going to be the most exciting thing. And I think Orff knew this. So he gave it to us for a second time at the end. And I, I think that's just going to be so unbelievably thrilling. But but there's lots of other stuff, as Bob said, that there's the loud stuff that's very impressive and well known. But but some of the most beautiful parts of this piece are the more intimate lyrical sections, especially the the solos, uh, the soprano solos and the section about love. There's a there's a, a sort of a wonderful sort of youthful love scene that we hear about and and the music that that Orff gets from his from his singers there is really quite beautiful um and so I'm looking forward to that to that and the sounds again that I can use on the organ to to bring those colors out from the yes. score yeah I am a bit of a football junkie and um, indeed last Saturday one of the pep bands played boom pa 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 at one <laughs> or dramatic uh, point in the football game. And nice. <laughs> um, well, speaking of the solos and the soloists, they're both incredible. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about both of them, starting with Molly Harmon. You know, Molly is a Mainer, uh, born in Portland, um, uh, graduated from USM. Um, beautiful lyric, uh, Quasi dramatic. She's she's really got a range of color in her voice um, that is, uh, to my ear, um, quite stunning and appropriate for Carmina. Um, uh, Nicole, you were you were gracious enough to to hear the auditions with me, and uh, I, I think Molly is just going to deliver um, Carmina the way that Orff um, composed it. Um, the baritone is Aaron Ingebreth, and uh, many of you will know Aaron's voice um, as the voice of NPR, NPR, main public, the, the, the classical music station. Aaron has been, ooh, a year or so, I think, um, as, as the director of the uh, classical programming for main public. Um, Aaron has sung this uh, piece with the Boston Esplanade Orchestra, and uh, so he's a, he's a veteran of Carmina. Um, I think I think both of them will be really um, very special additions to this. And of course, that leaves um, wh wh what are we doing for a tenor? 
Um, my favorite local tenor is experiencing vocal problems and with regret um, announced to me that he would not be available. And so I had the idea to put together a group of falsettists because what this requires of the tenor is a high D, um, which is out of the range of the tenor, most tenor solos. Um, and so we, we've got a group of five that are singing the, the tenor Lament of the Roasted Swan um, as an ensemble rather than as a solo. It's a, it's a pretty amazing sound that they come up with. Awesome. Uh, as you mentioned, Bob, I did get to hear the Molly audition for uh, the solos, and I was absolutely blown away. And, and I know that she's just going to do a stunning job of these incredibly difficult and very beautiful soprano solos. Um, James, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would uh, like to share about Carmina and, and this particular concert? Yeah, well, as a, as a prelude to the the, the coming of Burana, I thought it would be fun to play uh, an orchestral, an operatic prelude, in fact. And I chose the William Tell Overture, which I actually played in my um, my very first concert overtures at, with the, the Kochmar organ. And it's partly because it has so much drama to it. It's you'll many of you will know the beginning starts with a a beautiful cello solo. It's meant to be like the dawn. Um, and and then suddenly there's a storm that comes, and then the lightning strikes, and then the the the, um, the storm dissipates, and then we have the calling of the calling to the dairy cows in the in the, the Swiss mountainside with a beautiful English horn cor anglais solo, um, and then the final part is the the march of the Swiss soldiers. So that the overture has these four very characteristic elements again that can show off the drama, the theatre of the Kochmar organ. Um, and it was something when I transcribed it, it, it was, I did it directly for the Kochmar. So I had all of the sounds that it can make in mind when I, when I made the selections of which gets and um, which instruments. So that will form the, the overture, the prelude, as it were, to Carmina. Um, they're not really about the same thing because, well, Carmina Burana isn't really about anything. It's just about things that happen. It's just about life. <laughs> um, um, very, very actively um, animated with all these texts. But I thought it would it was just a nice pairing in terms of those orchestral sonorities. Um, and Rossini was known as the the Italian Mozart. He was by far and away the most popular composer in, of his day. And and William Tell was one of his most popular operas. I think it was premiered in 1839. Um, and that that overture is is something that so many people recognize. And I think we wanted to recognize this concert is going to be maybe the first time people have heard the Kochmar organ, or if it's not the first time they've heard it, the first time they really realize they're hearing it, not just as part of a symphony concert or something like that. So we wanted to make this music as as open and as accessible and enjoyable as we possibly could. So I think that's another reason that we, we chose the William Tell overture. Yeah. Well, thank you. And Bob, is there anything that we haven't touched on uh, in today's conversation that you want to share about Carmina and uh, and our upcoming concert. Well, I want to second what James just said about the William Tell. I think that that is just a stunning setup for Carmina that is to come. Uh, we really haven't talked too much about the texts and about the composers of those texts. Um, I guess it you could say these are the bad boys of the of the Middle Ages, um, highly literate. Um, and scholarly individuals who, uh, I guess you could call them societal misfits, um, trained perhaps as clerics, uh, trained as academics, and then uh, just uh, sort of didn't quite fit in here or there. And so what they wrote was satire. What they wrote um, was about the, the joys of springtime and, and young love and new love and the blossoming of love that is possible in the springtime, passionate texts, and for me, always compelling texts, which makes the preparation um, all the more delightful. Wonderful. Well, on that note, um, I will remind everyone again that our concert is on October 2nd, Sunday, October 2nd at 3.30, Carmina Burana with Choral Art, joined by a um, hundred additional singers and James Kennerly 
the municipal organist of the Kochmar organ, um, also presented by the Friends of the Kochmar organ. And we're so excited about this concert. We hope that you will come uh, to see us in person. And if you can't, uh, you can also go on to portix.com to um, order tickets to watch the concert from the comfort of your own home. And uh, we'll see you all on October 2nd. And until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you. <laughs>